Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Christian Klein. I'm working with Elastasis. Um, and also, I'm an adjunct professor at UM University. I guess I don't need to mention both located in Sweden. And I'm passionate about cloud computing and information security. I'm also the architect of Compliant Kubernetes, which is an open source and CNCF certified Kubernetes distribution with focus on data protection regulations such as GDPR and Swedish patient uh, data. And we are operating compliant Kubernetes for various customers in health tech, in ad tech, and in fintech on five EU cloud providers. And we're also helping some of our customers set up Kubernetes on their on-prem installations. And today, I would like to share with you uh, some of the experience that we have gather gathered while ourselves doing this trip with Kubernetes and helping others also do the Kubernetes trip. And I would like to start a little bit by, let's say, building up some positive energy, right? Why do we bother with Kubernetes at all if it's so challenging and so complicated to operate securely? And then once we build that uh, positive energy, I would like to discuss to you as what we identified to be the top four challenges when operating a secure Kubernetes platform. So since you're here, I'm super convinced that all of you agree that Kubernetes is the answer. But what was the question? Ah, yeah, right. So let me just remind you a little bit, uh, like I said, to build this positive energy on what was the question that Kubernetes is trying to answer. And let's start from the older top, like from 30,000 feet, the business context. Nowadays, when you're launching a cool new product, you're no longer having this nice crystal ball in which you come up with the requirements and you figure out exactly what to implement. Rather, you are discovering your requirements by testing features against the market. So you build something, you then measure the impact that it has on the market, and then based on that, you learn what to build next. And this is called lean thinking. And in lean thinking, the success of your application, your new product, doesn't only depend on how well you execute each of these steps individually, but it also depends on how quickly you can iterate through these various cycles. Now, technologically, in order to support lean thinking, one of the technologies that has been, or concepts and technologies that have been adopted is application containerization. It is proven to help developers to make high impact changes frequently with minimal downtime. And the reason why it does this is, well, because it, um, it just avoids this ugly phenomenon where things work in development and somehow when you're pushing that application to production, I don't know, you have different application dependencies, you have Python 3.6 here, Python 3.7 there, stuff just breaks, right? So basically what containers are, are an application neutral way to package the application, all of these dependencies, so as to reduce friction between deployment, uh, between development and production. And sooner or later, if you are running many containers, you might want to run these containers on several nodes, whether these nodes are virtual machines or they are physical servers, in which case you will have to deal with, um, yeah, first of all, let me say why you would want to run them across several nodes. And we generally think of three reasons. First of all, because your application so got so crazy successful, that you can no longer just add more capacity to it by going for a bigger node, in which case you have pretty much no choice, but you need to have more nodes. So that's what we call horizontal scaling. The other reason is redundancy. Um, you know, servers go down, hard drives fail, but that's not usually a, an acceptable excuse nowadays anymore for application failing. So you want to run your application across several nodes just for redundancy. And then finally, some application containers, they need you know, a lot of memory if you're, for example, running an in-memory cache. Some of them might benefit from fast local SSDs, yet other workloads might want the GPU. So you might want to run your application across several nodes just to make sure that you're having the right resources to the right container. And once you do that, so once you have settled on running containers on several nodes, you will have to deal with container orchestration. And what does that mean? Well, you'll have to schedule somehow to decide what container goes on what node. 
you will have to create something like a network to allow these containers to talk to each other. You will have to create something like internal DNS to make sure that, well, one container can discover to what other container to speak. Um, you will also have to deal with things like self-healing, right? If one node goes down and takes down some of those containers, you'll want to have some kind of system that quickly starts those um, containers on some other node. And of course, there are many, many solutions to these particular problems, including doing it yourself. Um, there have been organizations that have been solving all of these problems quite successfully, you know, bash scripts or whatnot. However, Kubernetes stands out because it is, first of all, open source, so people really appreciate it not having any licensing costs. It is also open governance, um, and this is quite a concern lately because there were quite a few open source projects in the last years that have simply changed license from one day to another and basically took, you know, depending on what side of the conversation you are, but from the, some part of the conversation, it feels like, well, all of those uh, input and feedback from the community suddenly got kind of lost overnight. And it's certainly seen as a risk for the operations of a business. Kubernetes is also very popular, which means that you're going to be more likely to find uh, the right skills, right? Whether you are looking for Kubernetes users or for Kubernetes administrators. It's also extensible thanks to mechanisms such as custom resource definitions, webhooks, and operators. It has a huge ecosystem around it, so it really feels like, well, if you want to add some logging on top of Kubernetes and containers, there's a Helm chart for that. And if you want to collect some metrics and have some fancy dashboards, there are Helm charts for that, and so on. And finally, uh, for those of us who have on-call rotations and are potentially woken up at 2 a.m., it's really nice to know that Kubernetes is battle tested and production ready. So that also gives it a bit of an edge compared to doing things by yourself. And note, however, that Kubernetes is really just an engine, a very powerful engine, but you still need to build a car around it. So at the very least, people expect Kubernetes to have something like observability and security, right? Some kind of solutions for logs and for metrics, for example. And increasingly, Kubernetes is also being used in order to not only store stateless application containers, but also additional services that are absolutely critical nowadays for rapidly delivering an application, such as databases or message queues or in-memory caches and whatnot. So therefore today, I'm mostly going to discuss Kubernetes-based platforms, right? Where, of course, we understand that Kubernetes is an essential component, but it's by far not the only one. And this leads me to what I would like to call the Kubernetes paradox. So ever since it was launched in 2015, it has been increasingly easy to set up Kubernetes clusters. Nowadays, we have, application, we have uh, projects such as KubeSpray or Cluster API, which allow you in anything between 10 to 30 minutes to spin up a Kubernetes cluster on, honestly, whatever hardware is being thrown at you, not just managed services of the big uh, cloud providers. At the same time, it has become increasingly easy to set additional services on top of the platform, right? Thanks to a uh, rich ecosystem of Helm charts, thanks to operators for various databases, message queues, and so on. Nevertheless, I'm talking to people, and it still seems that it's very difficult to operate a Kubernetes platform, especially if you want to keep security and stability in mind. So why is that? And let me share with you the top four challenges that we have discovered as being those that are, let's say, preventing organizations from reaping all the benefits of Kubernetes. And these are setting um, scope, having fostering the right alerting culture, regularly doing disaster recovery training, and have, um, developing the right maintenance habits. And I'm really hoping that at the end of my talk, I will not only be able to illustrate to you the problem, but also give you some action actionable advice that you can take home in order to help you operate your secure Kubernetes platform. So let me start with um, setting the scope. And I hope I'm not getting too emotional here, but I would really like to share an anecdote with you. So this is a picture that I've taken uh, this summer at my parents' place. And it is a three-volume handbook 
uh, called Engineering Handbook written in 1911. It's, I actually checked the publishing date, it still survived that many years. And I actually browsed to this book and it's absolutely fascinating, right? You have 3,000 3, pages that tell you everything from different steel profiles to how to mix concrete to um, building and designing an electric circuit and even designing a car. It was absolutely amazing. Now, for some reason, I get the feeling that people understand that, well, engineering has evolved as a discipline quite a lot, so these 3,000 pages are not enough for anyone doing engineering nowadays, right? I mean, and I certainly wouldn't talk to an electrician, to an electrical engineer on how to mix concrete, and I would certainly not speak to a civil engineer on how to design my electrical cir circuits, right? Unfortunately, <laughs> when it comes to software engineering, it really feels to me that that's how people are thinking, like, oh, uh, this is tech, right? Can we just hire more DevOps engineer to deal with the more tech that we have acquired, right? And there's no proper scoping. Um, you're supposed to do both a little bit of user interface design and Android app development. Oh, by the way, we have this storage cluster in the basement. Nobody's really taking care of it. Can you figure out why it's beeping? So, and, and think about it. So, this might be okay, learning on the job, of course, is something that we all do, but when you're asking people to sacrifice their evenings and their nights and to troubleshoot things at 2 a.m., you know, they need to know all this stuff I with muscle memory and it's simply too much knowledge to keep in any single brain. So what you should do instead is to split up your technology stack in some more manageable pieces. And generally, I like to think about the technology stack as belonging to the application team, to the platform team, and to the infrastructure team. Now, some of these teams might be insourced. If you're using cloud computing, that's kind of their charm, right? You're essentially having an outsourced infrastructure team or maybe even an outsourced platform team. And I have seen many ways of doing scoping, right? In some companies, the platform team was rather what I would say up the stack, so they were responsible for doing something like what I would call application platform boilerplate, right? They were supposed to write some code that deals with how should the application handle sick term and how should the application properly drain connections and how should the application do proper database schema migration. And I have also met platform teams which were rather lower down the stack where let's say they were responsible for keeping up um, storage clusters and to making sure that they're healed and, and whatnot. And to be very honest with you, I'm starting to draw the conclusion that it doesn't really matter exactly how you do the scoping, as long as this is clear to everybody and as long as you assign the right skills to the right task. So any kind of scoping might make sense, just make sure you have some kind of scoping in place. And so, why is scoping important? Well, first of all, it avoids blame games because it's so easy to just say like, well, your CD, I, CD pipeline didn't work and then finger back at me like, well, but I thought you take care of the CD pipeline because as Git blame said that you commit some code two years ago and so on, right? Whereas if I know that I'm responsible for something, I really take ownership for it, I will take care of it and I won't be, um, it's also a little bit clearer when things are falling, let's say between the chairs on who needs to talk to whom in order to figure out a common way forward. And this leads me to the second benefit of having a proper scope. It really empowers the platform team. So instead of every single decision being an on-hands meeting, which may span three teams, the platform team is empowered to take decisions within the platform to best decide how to keep it secure and stable. So for example, a platform team might decide, yep, it is a best practice not to run containers as root in production. We're going to enforce that best practice as opposed to having to, you know, get too much buy-in for all over the organization to make that kind of change. As I said before, it assigns the right skills to the right task. And in case any of you are looking for some kind of data protection certification or in fact also, you know, medical device regulations, your auditors will be pretty quick at picking up if you have too few people to, I mean, too few people are assigned too many responsibilities. They, 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 they somehow have a, six stands for that and they will very quickly pick up and report a non-conformance on that. And then the thing that I also really like a lot is that it fosters clear customer relationship, which you know, if you're buying into the concept of customer obsession, you can then have that internally. So in a way, 
the application users become customer to the application team, the application team becomes customer to the platform team, and then the platform team becomes customer to the, to the infrastructure team. And each of these teams, then they may run their mini product management function and their mini customer success function in order to best serve the teams that are above and to best understand what the team below should work on next. So let me give you purely an example of how I would do the scoping. So in case of our Kubernetes platform, uh, we see that within the scope is the Kubernetes cluster itself. That's kind of obvious. But we also see as being within the scope the system pods, so all of those pods that are necessary in order to keep the cluster secure, observable, and stable. Um, for those of you who are familiar, we're talking here about FluentD, we're talking here about Prometheus, we're talking here about various such technologies. We also take care of the CD tool, but very importantly not of what actually goes into the CD, so the CD configuration that's outside the scope of the platform. And then we also take care of uh, databases and message queues and whatnot, which we also consider part of the platform. And then outside the scope of the platform, you know, if your application code doesn't build properly, that's outside our scope. Or if some kind of application pod is restarting, is crash loop restarting, again, outside the scope. That being said, um, it's also kind of important to be mindful about the things that are around you and not completely neglect things that are outside uh, your scope. So for example, a colleague of mine, uh, Lars Larsson, he recently held a presentation at DevOps Malmö, Principles for Designing and Deploying Scalable Application or Kubernetes. And he showed that, well, if you're following certain principles at the application level, you're making platform development so much easier and platform operations so much easier. So for example, if your application, let's say that your application tells you, well, our application doesn't tolerate node restarts. That makes it so difficult to roll out a Linux kernel patch, for example, which is required in order to keep the platform secure. So in that case, it's also a very good idea to be mindful about the fact that, well, I still need to check a little bit to, to conduct a mini audit on the application field if they have the right skills and if their application has uh, follows the best practices in order to make sure that platform operations easy. And similarly, I would also recommend to do something like infrastructure audit to really understand better is what where the infrastructure team is both technically but also organizationally. So it may come as a surprise to you, but during one of these mini audits, we actually discovered at some point that the platform team was telling us they need to have Kubernetes up 24 seven. And then during that mini audit, we discovered that, well, the infrastructure team is actually only awake between six to 22, right? What do you do? Well, the solution once you discover a discrepancy is pretty easy, right? Either the platform can only be up from six to 22, or the infrastructure team needs to upgrade their contracts in order to also have more on-call duty, right? But, you know, you need to be aware of stuff that is outside your scope in order to, in order to make sure that the application infrastructure is working with you and not that you're working against them. And this last observation brings me to alerting culture, which is the second challenge that I've discovered with operating a secure Kubernetes platform. So what I noticed is that setting up alerts is so incredibly easy, right? Um, if you have no clue where to start, just pick Prometheus. There is this awesome project here, which is actually called Awesome Prometheus Alerts. Um, it has so much inspiration, such nice and colorful alerts. Like if you, you can, for example, just copy paste the PromQL statement that which alerts if the disk is predicted to be full within three days, right? Super, I mean, getting with that, actually writing that PromQL is difficult, but just copy pasting it to understand it is so easy, right? Nevertheless, alerting is still really hard. And the reason why it's hard is that, well, you know, alert, an alert essentially means that, hey, the Kubernetes cluster, the Kubernetes platform needs human attention. And then it's very difficult to come up with the right amount of alerting so that you don't under alert where, let's say the Kubernetes platform is struggling but you don't notice, but also you don't over alert where you know the whole team is getting alert fatigue, there is a general feeling of crying wolf, and at some point people are just, well, ignoring even the important alerts. So this book doesn't exist yet, but I plan to publish it. <laughs> yeah, and this, um, this leads me to a general observation that somehow 
alerting feels like that thingy that you do, but nobody really is motivated to do or nobody really wants to put time in it. So here is how I would recommend you to ask for buy-in for stakeholders for fostering a proper, actually putting energy and time into fostering the right alerting culture. Your CEO will want to avoid disappointed customer, customers. Your chief information security officer or your data protection officer will understand that, well, this is part of their instant management process. And when they hear that, they will be very keen on doing something about it. And then for the platform team itself, it just gives such a nice feeling of not having any unknown unknowns and actually knowing that everything works as opposed to having this feeling like, can I really change this? Can I really upgrade this component? Will that lead to, to breakages that I might not be able to foresee, right? So alerts is one way of avoiding unknown unknowns. And so how do you foster a good alerting culture? Um, first of all, distinguish between P1, P2, and P3 alerts. Then have a clear alerting workflow. And finally, empower the team to tune alerts. And I'm going to talk about all of this in more details in the next slide. So terminology differs a little bit. This is my terminology. You may disagree on the terminology, but let's just say that I have checked other terminologies and they kind of map well to the concept I'm presenting. Um, I like to classify alerts into P1 or needs attention immediately or wake up somebody at 2 a.m. alerts. And these are mostly relevant for people that want to have the platform up and secure outside office hours. And these should really be reserved only for incidents where downtime or data loss is imminent, right? Because they're very disruptive. They may potentially wake up people's, uh, people during their sleep. They may potentially ruin weekends. It's, it's not very nice. And so examples of such alerts would be, for those of you who know the intricacies of ETCD, of uh, Kubernetes, you don't really want to hear ETCD quorum lost. You would want to <laughs> jump out of your bed and nearly check what's going on and how can I recover from that situation as quickly as possible. Or, you know, sometimes if the disk space is getting full for a database, that also may mean that, well, application downtime is imminent and so on. Or another scary situation that you might encounter is, for example, you have a replicated Postgres cluster and then suddenly you have two primaries where the application is kind of confused. Uh, should I write here or should I write here or should I write half here and half there? And there's just confusion of where your data actually lands. And although P1 alerts are needed, um, you should try hard to avoid them because as I keep telling some of our uh, customers, hardware is cheap, people's sleep is really expensive. And the way you can avoid them is by investing in redundancy or in predictions. So by redundancy, I mean, for example, do run three control plane nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. I know it costs more, but it's still cheaper than losing your only DevOps engineer. Um, make sure that you have two replicas for all of your deployments. Um, nowadays, I think it will come by default with Kubernetes clusters, but just check that you have the proper topo um, topology spread constraints to make sure that you don't have those replicas ending up on the same node, but that they're properly spread on various nodes. And then if you need to and want to add, like say the cherry on top of the pie, do run your cluster across multiple zone. There are a few EU cloud providers that nowadays offer that. And then the other way, predictions. Uh, well, you have this awesome function in Prometheus, which is called predict linear. So you can, can create rules with it, such as alert me if disk will be full in three days based on how quickly it has been filling during the last hour, right? And that can convert a P1 disk is full into an incident that I can prevent, right? And three during office hours. And although it's not possible to completely avoid uh, P1 alerts, the other thing that you can do is to make them a little bit less stressful for the on-call engineer by providing them a clear workflow. And here I would argue to distinguish what needs to happen during the night? And this needs to be, you know, very simple, explained to a monkey, because as far as my experience goes, engineers that are woken up at night are not very smart, or at least I'm not very smart if I'm woken up out of my sleep. But essentially, you want to have a workflow which, you know, is executed ve very simply, and essentially tells, should I try to fix this issue with a certain timeout after which uh, the problem should be escalated? Or should I just silence the alert because this is a spurious alert, this is a bogus alert, and I should just go back to sleep and dump my frustration on the rest of the team 
next morning, right? And then during the day, well, there the whole team is awake. You might have more senior people around. You have uh, a bigger team. Maybe you also have a meeting in which you can discuss these things. So then you can take a little bit things slower and figure out, okay, what was the root cause of the issue? Uh, what can be done in order to avoid this alert in the future? And so on. And then we have P2 alerts or needs attention within a business day. Um, these are rather disruptive because, to be honest with you, I'm sometimes sitting next to the person who is on call, and it's kind of annoying to keep hearing their phone like it happens around one, once an hour for us. Nevertheless, they don't ruin evenings, they don't ruin weekends, and most importantly, they don't disturb sleep. Um, they can also be taken rather calmly and slowly because other team members are awake. And example of P2 alerts includes, well, Kubernetes node went down, Hopefully you have enough resili resilience so that it's not something that requires immediate attention. Person volume will be full within three days. Host disk will be full within three days. PostgreSQL primary failed, no problem. You still have a secondary. Uh, nicely backup failed, well, you're a little bit outside your, your backup targets, but that's not a problem. You can catch up during the day. That's, that's typical examples for me for P2 alerts. And finally, we have P3 alerts, which I would just call review regular alerts. So these are not really things that are very actionable. You cannot really do something on a spot with them, but at some point, hopefully, you see a pattern emerging, and then you can actually come up with more actionable fixing. So things that are P3 alerts, like you have always that one pod that for some reason is crashing and restarting, but you know, no SLA is being impacted by that, so doesn't really feel like you want to jump on it immediately or we sometimes had CPU throttling, right? When, let's say, a Fluent collector pod was going above its uh, request limit. Well, that's not kind of nice. You kind of want to be aware of it, but it doesn't make you jump off your seat and check immediately what's happening either, right? I mean, it's very difficult to figure out what has happened without seeing a pattern emerging. Or let's say that some kind of buffers that are there to be filled, right, and to protect other systems have kind of filled above a predefined threshold no biggie, they didn't get overfilled, but you might still want to be aware that this kind of happens too often and maybe you want to increase that buffer size. And that's, that's really cool and handy, right? But uh, I often hear people complaining to me like, okay, but how do I know if an alert should be P1, P2, or P3? And unless you have a crystal ball, um, you won't be able to come up with a satisfactory answer to this. So what I recommend people is rather to engineer for change rather than engineer for perfection. And the way we, for example, have set this up is that the Kubernetes cluster itself with Prometheus is over alerting. So it's making sure that it complains about absolutely everything that is event worthy inside the cluster, you name it. And then um, it, it of course labels those alerts with enough information to understand which, which pod it was, which namespace it was, which cluster it was, and so on was the production or staging environment which encountered issue. And then we do prioritization and silencing of alerts from our on-call management tools. We use Ops Genie, but I haven't really heard anybody complaining about PagerDuty either. Um, I guess it's less important the tooling and more important that you actually empower the team to uh, fine tune alerting as it goes. And then once you got the alerting culture going, then to be very honest with you, the technological part is kind of boring. Um, we just have usually two clusters in each environment, and then we have a Prometheus which is dealing mostly with application alerts, which are delivered to the application developers on-call management tool. And then we have a similar configuration, also another Prometheus and Thanos bundle, which then alerts the administrators about uh, platform alerts. And as long as each team gets the right alerts and they can act on them, everybody's happy. Okay, but what should the team do if they get one of the worst alerts in their life? Like, yeah, for example, etc D quorum lost, and I'm not sure how many, I would certainly not know how to recover from something like that. So the team needs to be also assured that there's always a way out, right? That even the worst incident has a light at the end of the tunnel. And this is why disaster recovery training is so important. Now. In case you need some scary materials to convince your bosses to actually allow you to do disaster recovery training, um, ransomware attacks are increasingly on the rise. 
and it seems like some companies accept to pay the ransom, which sounds a bit surprising, especially because they actually do backups. The problem is that they don't regularly test those backups. They don't know in how much time they can recover from such a disaster. So in that case, it just feels cheaper to pay the ransom, uh, risking potentially never seeing their data again, rather than doing proper disaster recovery. And for better or worse, data centers catch fire. It doesn't happen too often, but when it happens, you kind of just want to know that it's not your problem, right? So what I want to argue with these two examples is that really we do backups is not enough nowadays and that you regularly need to train whether you're able to recover a system based on your backups. So another way, another idea of why is disaster recovery training so important, just think about airplane pilots, right? Um, I have seen, I, I'm sometimes following YouTube channels, so that's my dirty hobby for the evenings, and there are airplane pilots that, you know, they went through a whole career without any airplane incident. Nevertheless, on a yearly basis, they had to train for all kinds of scenarios, such as engine catching fire and flaps not going out for landing and stuff like this. And why? Well, because if the situation actually happens, you just want to have a few cool pilots that say like, yeah, I remember what to do, <laughs> plane down, okay, let's, let's figure this out later, right? And you kind of want the same feeling also in your platform team, right? When you're having an incident, it's just so stressful to know like, oh shit, the application might go down, and that means that the customers might also be impacted. And it's just, I don't know if you ever had to go through an incident, but to me, they just feel like such ugh, stressful events. The other thing is that disaster recovery may be extremely complex and stressful. So the more often you rehearse it, the, the easier it gets. And then what I also notice is that regularly uh, doing disaster recovery training is also improving team morale, right? You always know that, okay, there is an incident, we got it, in very worst case, we just restore for backup, we know how, it do how it's done, we know how it works, but let's focus now on trying to recover from this situation because I think we can do it. It also allows you to measure recovery time objective, and I'm going to talk about it a bit more in the next slide. And if still you haven't convinced stakeholders within your organization to do disaster recovery training, just tell them that it's mandatory by law, right? If you have to comply with Swedish uh, data protection law, um, I can give you the exact article. Ju just send them this line here. <laughs> and, uh, and there is actually a paragraph which says that you should regularly test backups based on a risk assessment that has been done. So let's zoom in a little bit on what exactly backups are about. So if this is the timeline, then somewhere here is the oldest backup you have. So you cannot really recover to data as it was before this. And somewhere here you have the newest backup. So again, you have a bit of a gap here between where the disaster occurred and your earliest backup. And this gap here we call it usually recovery point objective. Um, if you're taking, for example, nightly backups, then your recovery point objective is 24 hours, right? In worst case, you lose 24 hours worth of data. If you're using something like Postgres uh, point in time recovery and you're uploading the wall files every five minutes to somewhere, then you're having a five minutes recovery point objective. And then this is usually called backup retention. And then from the moment you um, declare the disaster, you need to run various processes in order to restore backups, whatnot. And then the time that passes to the system actually being recovered, that's what we call the recovery time objective, right? So coming back to the ransomware attacks, we see that very many companies just don't know the recovery time objective, which is why they just prefer to pay the ransom and hope, hope that they can call it a day. Um, often, you might get these numbers decided for you. Unfortunately, that's not how I often experience things. Um, generally, you know, a data protection officer would expect a recommendation for a platform team, like, okay, so what do we put in our policy? Although it's them who decides you're still kind of technically more knowledgeable to bring a recommendation. And here, you need to be mindful about the fact that, well, you have this thing in GDPR called the right to be forgotten. So the more you store backups, the more you need to remember to forget, right? If I told you today that please delete uh, username, please delete my data off your systems. Well, delete from tables user where uh, first name Christian, last name Klein, done, right? But that data is still in the backups and you need to have processes for making sure that you don't accent the recovery. So often what is happening is that, well, you just keep a rather short window to make sure that you don't need 
you, you cannot forget to recover. And that's why you generally would not want to keep a too large backup retention window. And this one, for example, well, the shorter your RPO, the recovery point objective, generally the higher the cost, right? If you, for example, do a full backup every night, that's one cost. Whereas if you do a full backup every six hours, say your system doesn't support point-in-time recovery, then that's a complete different cost. And even if your system supports point-in-time recovery and only um, uploads the diffs, right? Depending on how write-heavy your application is, that might still contain a quite huge uh, backup cost. So just be mindful about these decision drivers where choosing your objectives. And then when it comes to the technological implementation, I like to think of it as in, in two terms, like from the platform team perspective. Either you have some kind of generic solution for backups. So for example, there is this uh, project which plays very nicely with Kubernetes called Velero, which is able to backup um, all of the Kubernetes resources, deployments, services, ingresses, whatnot, and also the data from application versus volume claims. So this is kind of nice, right? It's a generic tool. You can use it for very many purposes across very many applications. The downside is that it tends to store more data than strictly necessary, right? The application might have generated data on that persistent volume claim. Uh, some applications might not actually be liked to restore that way. Um, so on one hand, it's nice because you need to know fewer tools, but on the other hand, you might need to store more data and might still need to be aware of some application-specific quirks. On the other extreme, you might want to use some application-specific ways to back up the data. So for example, if you're running Harbor as a container registry, it actually has a process for how to take backup and how to recover from it. And that particular process makes sure that it only stores the minimum amount of data needed in order to recover a container registry. And I recommend you to use uh, as the backup location S3 compatible object storage. I kind of, maybe that's obvious to some of you, but I kind of get increasingly surprised how few on-prem installations have S3 compatible object storage. And the reason why this is a very good abstraction to keep backups is first of all, because it's more reliable generally than file systems. It is also a bit more cost effective since it doesn't need to implement a full POSIX semantics, but just you know a bit of uh, REST semantics here and there. It's also a bit easier to synchronize to say an offsite location. And it's also very widely available abstraction. So nowadays you have it across all U US cloud providers, across EU cloud providers. And there are quite a few solutions also if you want to uh, have object storage on-prem. So I highly recommend this to make it like, let's say your final destination of your backups. And then don't forget also to protect your backups. And if you're using object storage, that's rather easy. Um, either you set object lock, which is supported by quite a few object um, storage solutions out there. So object lock is essentially a metadata on your objects or on your bucket, which says like, even if I tell you to delete this particular object, don't allow me to do that unless 30 days have passed. Or even if I want to override this object with a new object, don't allow me unless 30 days have passed. Um, you can then use projects such as rclone for offsite replication and rclone even supports some encryption parameters so that you can do what people call off cloud replication so you might be able to run all of your application uh, code in in say a fully eu owned technology stack and then for those rare uh, black swan events just to set up rclone with encryption and store it in a say us cloud provider in a gdpr friendly way And then it's, yeah, many people ask me, okay, but how exactly do we conduct a disaster recovery drill? Where first of all, you need to agree on a frequency, for example, quarterly. Then you need to figure out what are the goals of this disaster recovery? How, how do you decide it was a successful disaster recovery drill? And then usually what, what one would mention is that, well, we want to ensure that documentations are up to date and we want to measure the recovery time objective. Who should be part of this drill? Because it's kind of expensive to take the way the team away from productive development into the training. So you may, for example, have half the team trade every three months so that every team member gets um, two disaster recovery trainings every year. You need to decide on how should the environment look like before the disaster? What is the scenario of the disaster? Like it can be as simple as, well, we lost the metrics, please investigate and restore them. Or it might be as sophisticated as we lost a whole data center 
please recover the system from, uh, please do a full recovery from backups. And then it's also a very good idea to reserve time during these uh, training sessions for retrospective, like what went well, what went wrong, and what are concrete steps that we can do to make it better next time. And doing this regularly just ensures that your disaster recovery posture only goes up and never down. Um, let me share with you some of the common issues that we encountered, not during disaster recovery, but fortunately during the training sessions which were preceding them. So for example, we noticed that it was unclear to the application team what is the backup scope, and you don't really want to end up in conversation, well, I thought you would back that up, whereas, oh no, I thought you would back that up, and things like that. So it was a very good idea to have this disaster recovery drill together with the application team to clarify the backup scope and, well, make sure that the right data is backed up. Sometimes we had cases where the application was crashing after restore and needed a few manual steps to recovery. And if this is known in advance, the application team might not complain about it, but of course it would be pretty stressful for them to discover this only while a disaster recovery is happening, right? We also had some um, issues with Valero. For example, it wasn't restoring the service account token in certain conditions. And we like to use service account tokens to integrate with um, robots, right? Like CD, C continuous delivery systems. So in that case, those were those integrations were breaking after the disaster recovery, and we needed to do small fixing, you know, to make sure that it works again. Again, nothing big, but if you know it in advance, it's not a big thing. If you discover it while doing disaster recovery, it's quite stressful. And finally, we also have an, had an um, discovered an issue where Valero was, for example, recovering. Kubernetes resources in a wrong order. So for example, in compliant Kubernetes, we want all of the deployments to be selected by network policy to really make sure that you had something like firewall rules right around your deployments and don't just allow your application to talk to strangers as too many applications were doing when log for shell uh, came about. So in that case, if Valero restores the deployment before network policy, then well, our Kubernetes platform complains like, these deployments are not selected by a, a network policy. I'm not allowing that. So again, not a big thing, but good to be aware of that beforehand. Let me then uh, move on to the last um, challenge that I noticed with Kubernetes platforms and that I hope I'm, I can help you with. So it seems like we as a species <laughs> have a bit of an issue when it comes to maintenance, right? It, it's kind of generally, you're, you're not seeing any big press release about this bridge has been maintained. I don't know how you feel, right? You're only seeing press releases when maintenance was neglected or didn't happen, right? And you would hope that we software engineers or platform engineers are smarter than civil engineers, but it's really not the case. Um, a Datadog report about Kubernetes clusters noticed that the most popular Kubernetes cluster at that time had already reached its end of life. So not only that it was vulnerable to security issues, but it wasn't even getting security patches anymore. So that's how seriously um, maintenance is being taken in our profession. And I recommend you to start with uh, good maintenance habits. You know, New Year's is coming soon. Maybe that's something that you should put as a New Year's resolution. Um, I would recommend you to first focus on cadence to make sure that it happens, right? And to do it manually. Uh, then to focus on predictability, so at some point to make it feel as boring as possible, like, oh, I just need to copy paste this markdown document and it's just happening, right? And then when you really pass that moment where um, maintenance is predictable and boring and the application team hasn't complained and no issues were discovered, only then try to figure out how to automate this. I noticed that too many teams are kind of rushing into automating maintenance without them properly having synchronized, like, does the application team actually know that you're about to restart nodes every now and then, or how, how, how does that, right? You need to first clear that interaction before you automate things. Um, and then it's good thing to think about automated updates at various levels, right? Because each one tends to have a bit their different solution. So for example, at the base OS level, you might be thinking more about installing the Ubuntu. If you're using Ubuntu, we like to install something like an unattend unattended updates package. And then there is a project called CureD, which makes sure that it takes a lock and then only restarts one node at a time, for example, if you get a, a Linux kernel update. Uh, for system pods, we like to use Tekton, but we found Flux, to be honest, almost equally good. It's just that, well, we had to choose one winner. 
And then application team really like Argosy because it also has a bit of a more user interface so they can get a bit better feedback on how the deployment went. Um, I just have two more slides if I can. Yes, sir. Okay, yes. so just want to share with you a few maintenance issues that we encountered. Um, insufficient replicas, uh, an application was just not handling sick term properly, so draining of the node was not possible and you couldn't reboot it. Sometimes application developers were leaving pod disruption budget, which was basically saying, don't ever touch my application. So there was again, no maintenance that could be done. And finally, when you're rebooting a node, you're, say you have three nodes and you're rebooting one of them, your cluster essentially ends up with two thirds of the capacity. So if you have insufficient capacity, then you cannot really do uh, maintenance. So to conclude, um, make sure that you set the scope to clarify what the platform team needs to deliver and what is provided with. Make sure to foster the right alerting culture to ensure that your team is aware but not overwhelmed with symptoms of potential issues. And then practice disaster recovery to make sure that the team always has a way out to bring the Kubernetes platform to a known good state. And with that being said, thank you for your attention and yeah, happy to take questions or please feel free to connect uh, with me on LinkedIn. Thank you. All right, good. So thank you, everyone. And um, usually, you know why we start uh, our um, presentation at uh, 1745. That's for people that are always late and included me. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry I was late. So I'm running uh, DevOps uh, Malmo. I'm organizer of DevOps Malmo. We are five years in the area. And uh, thankfully, we have great speakers like you that present. Uh, we can offer only two questions from audience. Uh, there is no question online, so only two questions, and the rest we take uh, when we do pizza, okay? Pizza doesn't like to wait, <laughs> all right? Is there anyone who has uh, questions? Only two. Go. <laughs> all right, thanks for a great uh, uh, presentation. I just have a question. Uh, do you see less or like equal problems with the services like e uh, AWS EKS or GCP GKA or something compared to uh, on-prem installation? Um, I couldn't really, I mean, to give you an honest answer on this, I would need to have data, and unfortunately I don't have that. Um, there is a general sentiment that US cloud providers might be more stable, but then again, you know, you have to then face, explain all of the people how do you deal with uh, compliance issues at GDPR, which some people just simply don't want to put up with. Nevertheless, there were outages also, right? And the problem is that if AWS goes down, what are we going to do, right? <laughs> Whereas if you work with a small local partner where at least maybe you can talk to them a little bit easier and figure out where are they and things like that. So I, I cannot really back that up by data. There is a general sentiment that favors uh, the big cloud providers, but they also <laughs> are doing mistakes, right? Thank you. So one last one, anyone? No? No, cool, all right, then uh, thanks. Oh, you wanna go? Okay. Yeah, uh, so uh, I thought this was uh, more about security vulnerabilities in Kubernetes, mm -hmm. but I mean, that was more organizi organizational. But what are the, the common vulnerabilities in Kubernetes? Because I'm really new to this yeah. part of community, and I wanna I wanna know what's like, uh, for instance, what are the common vulnerabilities that that pop up pop up like every now and then in in uh, Kubernetes quality? Yeah. So um, you're asking about vulnerability management in a Kubernetes-based platform. Not the management, but. Uh, 
vulnerabilities. The yeah. Vulnerabilities. Exactly. Yeah. So first of all, I apologize that I didn't talk about vulnerability management, which yeah. I agree with you is a very important topic. Yeah. That would have been number five on yeah. my list, yeah. and then people would have complained that I keep you here too long. Uh, <laughs> but essentially, exactly, I was talking about these things because you know there's no point in you talking about vulnerability management. Like you see a vulnerability and then you don't dare upgrade in Kubernetes cluster, right? It's it's kind of counterproductive before you know you can do maintenance, before you know that if a maintenance goes wrong, you have a disaster recovery. So I kind of just wanted to explain myself <laughs> of what I didn't talk about this important topic. And then when it comes to vulnerabilities, um, you kind of have to think about all of the stacks, right? So the Linux kernel, I would yeah, say, yeah. is yeah, the yeah. most problematic here. And there have been quite a few escape out of uh, container vulnerabilities. Yeah. Then, of course, the containers runtime are guilty, but usually not so much because they're just telling the Linux kernel what to do as opposed to doing things themselves. Um, Kubernetes had a few vulnerabilities, like, for example, uh, server side request forgeries and whatnot. They tend to be a problem mostly in multi tenant Kubernetes cluster. Like, if Kubernetes clusters are shared among um, application teams, we don't trust each other, right? If you are not using multi-tenant Kubernetes, then they are, let's say, less bad. And then, of course, since we're talking about the Kubernetes platform, you also have to think about the stuff that comes on top, right? So Grafana had, for example, some vulnerabilities, and I don't feel like I can just say, well, it's somebody else's problem, right? It's, <laughs> it's my problem as a platform engineer. Um, there was open, when the log for, log for shell vulnerability came out, that affected also open search, and, or sorry, we couldn't demonstrate it affected open search, but since since essentially open search also contains a log for J, it kind of just felt good to apply critical vulnerability. Did, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. All right, then uh, pizza is waiting. <laughs> so then the rest of question you can just ask uh, Christian, so he's gonna be here. And if you have question regarding meetup group or you want to present, I'm here. Okay, talk to me. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks.